My uh, little piece is Towards Enlightenment, Buddhism's Contribution to Common Good Through Establishing Contemplative uh, Culture. Okay, I'll just jump right in. <clears throat> Buddhism, says Professor Robert Thurman, who is American, noted American uh, uh, Buddhist scholar and practitioner of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, um, he says, Buddhism is a system of education. So the way I'm taking up uh, yeah, his statement is as follows. Buddhism is a curriculum and pedagogy that are designed to transform our consciousness at its roots, moving humanity from dualistic ego consciousness to non-dual post-ego consciousness. So that's kind of my terminology. Uh, traditionally, that's known as enlightenment. Eastern enlightenment in contrast to Western enlightenment of the 18th century. Dualistic consciousness sees the world, uh, world in terms of such categorical dichotomy as self, other, as well as a host of other binaries, mind, body, good, evil, or bad, right, wrong, moral, immoral, and so on. To note, the self, other dichotomy applies to individual persons as well as to groups and nations. Dualistic consciousness is the basis for self-other conflict, competition, and survival battles on both large and small scales. Large scales, of course. We have genocide, ethnic war, and all the wars. Small scales, sibling rivalry, although they can be applied to groups too, like three religions of the book. There seems to be a rivalry, right? Um, bloody ones. And uh, yeah, those of us who are married, marital uh, conflicts, that's a small, small enough scale. And also, inside us, there is so much battle going on. I hear so much about my students talking about how uh, self-critical they are. They're just criticizing themselves all the time, beating themselves up kind of thing. So uh, psychologically, this uh, notion of uh, conflict, conflicted uh, uh, consciousness is everywhere. Dichotomous positioning invariably brings about the attitude of indifference, avoidance, exclusion, and at the worst, active hostility and violence towards otherness. So next section I titled uh, Ego and Post-Egoic Consciousness. Another name that we can use for dualistic consciousness is ego consciousness. Ego is the self that sees itself as separate from the non-self, that is, whatever is Whatever is not seen as a self or belonging to the self, which if we, may, if we think about is really the rest of the cosmos, vast otherness. So one little ego facing vast otherness. That's totally scary. No wonder the little ego feels overwhelmed and threatened. Ego consciousness, therefore, constantly separates out what is self and what is not self, hence otherness. Ego consciousness, however, is not all there is to human consciousness. This can be a tricky point to establish, akin to, so this is my side, side remark, um, akin to explaining to a frog that there are other ponds than the little one that it inhabits. There are other modes of consciousness that we can loosely and generally term as post-ego consciousness. Basically, in post-ego consciousness, the self-other boundary is softened and made porous, which precipitates non-conventional, that is, non-ordinary experiencing of everyday events. I have some of my own experiences to relate to you. 28 years ago, I had a small dose of experiencing a post-ego consciousness. I was holding my newborn on my lap, and I was suddenly flooded with the felt sense of what I can only describe as timelessness, the ordinary sense of time that marches forward inexorably suddenly vanished, and I was left with a sense of foreverness. At the same time, I was completely relaxed in a way that was not at all familiar to me. I didn't think that I had much anxiety until that moment when I experienced complete freedom from anxiety. I was quite astonished by that experience, 
which seemed to be coming from an egoic thinking mind that was still somehow online and was commenting that this experience I was having was unreal, or at least foreign to me as an ego consciousness. Yet, the experience of timelessness was no less real than the reality of the ego mind speaking. And in some ways, it was more real in that I was more in that uh, post-ego mind than in the uh, ego mind. And then I was just as suddenly and fully back to my ordinary consciousness of marching time and subtle but persistent anxiety and so on. To be liberated from the mortal existential anxiety and released into the vastness of timelessness and oneness was an incredible experience of, uh, of uh, liberation. I've had, had many experiences as well that can be characterized as of non-ordinary consciousness, and I assure you that I don't do drugs or drink yet too much. Maybe this jet lag does help, I don't know. Um, all these gave me fleeting glimpses of outer reaches of ego consciousness. For sure, I'm not enlightened, not in the uh, sense of being permanently, that is, stably and sustainably established in the uh, post-egoic. I have had many moments of bliss. I have had experiences of abiding calmness and expansiveness. I've had exquisite moments of seeing everything around me in radiance, clarity, beauty. I experienced my whole being flooded with the uh, cosmic love, and I think all of you have had some moments like that, I'm pretty sure. But most importantly, in terms of uh, personally maturing through going beyond ego self, I'm getting a, a better handle on emotional reactivity that is part and parcel of dualistic ego consciousness. I don't react as often or as intensely as before, and I consider this an important indication of progress in bhavna, this uh, yeah, Pali term, uh, meaning in the Buddhist context, mental or spiritual cultivation. Although I'm being tested watching a uh, uh, presidential uh, talks in the States, <laughs> my reactivity is like, you know, <laughs> starting up. <clears throat> Bhavana has been conventionally translated into English as meditation, but that's not quite right. And if I have time, I could go into that, but we'll leave it at that. Important thing is this notion of cultivation, um, cultivation of humanity. So next section is titled uh, Mindfulness, which I'm sure you hear about a lot these days, an eightfold path for enlightenment. While Buddhism for sure has no monopoly on teaching people how to shift into post-egoic consciousness, it has, it has established itself as a rigorous and vigorous training program that has been in continuous operation over the span of 2,500 years. Now, having received the attention of empirical science, especially contemporary neuroscience, Buddhist contemplative practice is enjoying an enthusiastic support from scientific communities around the world. Its popularity as an anti-stress method is ever-mounting, infiltrating all sectors of public and private spheres, including the military, financial, entertainment, and education. Although people think now entertainment and education are synonymous. For our stress-ridden world, such a popularity is totally understandable, yet this popularity also poses a deep concern to scholars and serious practitioners of Buddhism. Mindfulness refers to a certain quality of attention and awareness that humans are capable of. So I'll characterize mindfulness or mindful awareness like this. Non-reactive, but not indifferent. Relaxed, but alert. Expansive, but not uh, uh, dispersed, focused, but not tense, clear, but not cold, penetrating, but not harsh, calm, but intense, gentle, but firm, and so on. I'll just leave that with you. With this kind of awareness, mindfulness is, is extremely functional and can be very useful in all sorts of contexts and ways. And as I mentioned, you know, military people use that and Financial people, I hear that, what is it, the stock exchange 
brokers, but I don't know the terminology, you know, they are trained in mindfulness so that they, I guess they don't faint under stress or whatever, you know, it's just. <laughs> and of course, in schools, school children, uh, their test anxiety is apparently helped by doing five, min five minutes uh, mindfulness. Anyway, hence, uh, this kind of a, um, uh, awareness can render itself to various uses and misuses. However, mindfulness is one component, although integral to a whole ecosystem of cultivation, namely Bahavana. This ecosystem or ecology of supportive learning processes is known as the Eightfold Path in Buddhism. Besides mindfulness, there are seven other integrated aspects of the path. So again, translation difficulties here. Typically, these are translated as right mindfulness, right view kind of thing. And I prefer uh, wholehearted. So I'll just use wholehearted in front of uh, yeah, these seven other factors uh, beside mindfulness. Wholehearted view, wholehearted emotion, wholehearted speech, wholehearted action, wholehearted livelihood, wholehearted effort, wholehearted concentration, Mindfulness supports every one of these seven factors. This whole path is then core curriculum of enlightenment. Engaging with this curriculum and diligently and wholeheartedly working on the self in accordance with the curriculum cultivates the right soil and environment for strong germination and nourishment of the enlightenment seeds. Next section. Dialogic consciousness as or for enlightenment. In enlightenment, one has transcended the self-other duality and embodies dialogic consciousness. What does that feel like within a person? What would we experience then, and why is that important for us in considering, uh, considering common good and world peace? I've been using fancy-sounding esoteric words, um, and my daughter is called the academies. So. <laughs> Like a post-egoic and dialogic consciousness, self-other duality, and, and so on. However, the phenomenon that we are trying to name is not at all esoteric. It's common enough, even if not well-developed. In fact, there are many words that are in popular use in English and point to the same phenomenon. Empathy, for instance, is in, the, uh, common use of, uh, uh, is in common use of everyday language in North America. It is without doubt and contemporary science apparently backs this up extensively, that human beings are born with the capacity for empathy. Neuroscientists claim to have discovered the mirror neurons that are responsible for phenomenology of empathy. Empathy is indeed a commonplace experience. When we see a person about to accidentally step on a sharp, rusty nail with a bare foot, we may react to, to what we see with a scream as if we are uh, stepping on a, a nail ourselves. It's not that we actually feel that person's f uh, pain. Rather, we cognitively and emotionally know and understand what that, parent, uh, what that experience is like. And effectively, we feel appropriate emotions in response to observing the event. In this case, shock and fear. These cognitive and affective signals may then prompt and propel us to take appropriate uh, appropriately helpful action, like lunging forward to prevent the person from stepping on the nail or uh, catching the person slumping down or expressing sympathy and so on. This vignette illustrates how empathy enables us to feelingly know what the other person is experiencing. But suppose that the person uh, who is about to step onto a nail is your mortal enemy, someone whom you dislike, hate, and against whom you harbor deep resentment or ill will because you feel that you're terribly wronged by this person or group of uh, people. Uh, this emotional disposition against the person might actively block your empathy from emerging within you. You may, in fact, experience a secret satisfaction that the person, is, uh, the person will experience hurts. You say under your breath, um, that serves her right. This is an example of self-other conflict and hostility being enacted. If you are in enlightened, however, and inhabited a post-ego consciousness, you probably would not experience this kind of enmity against your so-called enemy. In fact, to an enlightened person, there are no enemies, only those 
who are suffering from their own existentially unmet needs and have decided in keeping with the binary dichotomous worldview that you are their enemy. As an enlightened person, your empathy will come online unconditionally, regardless of whether you are with your friend or foe. Your empathy will be unobstructed by hatred and greed, fear and shame and so on. And you will want to protect your foe, foe from harm and with him or her well and wish, wish him, him or her well and that he or she will not suffer any hurt. Compassion and sorrow, forgiveness and forbearance would be what you are likely to experience. To a post-ego consciousness, this enactment of empathy is natural as a ripe plum falling to the ground, not out of moral obligation, moral programming, ethical calculus, social decency and decorum, and so on. In contrast, for an ego-driven consciousness, it's a different story altogether. Empathy does not surface when you are confronted with those whom you dislike, hate, loathe, fear. I mentioned that already. You can try to be nice, civil, polite, but that's not the same as being deeply empathic. Cognitively speaking, enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition would be about shifting out of the ego consciousness, consciousness that sees the world in self-other, friend-foe, good, bad, moral, immoral, animate, inanimate, and thousands of other binaries or dichotomies. It would be about shifting into seeing the world in complex and dynamic interaction and interpenetration. What does this mean? How does the world and uh, uh, ego selves and our ego selves appear to the gaze of the non-dual post-ego consciousness as our living Zen poet master and uh, peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh would put it, to an enlightened Buddha eye, a sheet of paper would show up as an entire ecosystem. Trees, forests, clouds, rain, mountains, streams, loggers, human tears, laughters, everything. In short, an entire cosmos is implicated in that sheet. Um, in the West, another poet beheld a, yes, a similar vision. Here's a quiz for you. To a world, uh, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palms of your hand and eternity in an hour. Who? Drake. Yes. William Blake. And I think I can find something from... Uh, Goethe, too, whom you know intimately. Effectively speaking, enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition has us feel love and kindness towards all beings, compassion for the afflicted, and joy with the happy others, all the while feeling securely nested in the cosmos. What I'm describing here is known as the four immeasurables in the Buddhist literature. They are metta, meaning loving kindness, Karuna, meaning compassion, mudita, meaning uh, empathic joy, and upeka, equanimity. One of my doctoral students' dissertation is on, um, all, on the uh, four immeasurables, in particular, empathic joy. He and I uh, thought that, uh, in fact, uh, compassion is easier than empathic joy for those of us who live in a capitalist society. <sighs> oh oh so, so let's see. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.